Our subject tonight, of course, is love and duty. I want to read to you from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Please write the texts and check them in your Bible. You'll enjoy getting into the habit of studying your Bible. Ephesians, chapter 5, and I'm going to read the 10th verse. It says, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now that's what it says in the authorized version. I'd like to read you another translation. And this is what it says, and I want you to listen very carefully. It says, try to find out what best pleases the Lord. Did you get that? Try to find out what best pleases the Lord. Now really, folks, that's what a real Christian does, and that's what a real Christian enjoys. Doesn't have to be some big thing, even a little thing. If it pleases the Lord, that's your pleasure. Amen? And that's what Paul is talking about. Now many times already out here we've had questions about uh, a, a new commandment. I was riding along in a car the other day and I heard a minister preaching about a new commandment. And Jesus did say, a new commandment I give. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22 and begin with verse 37 and see what the Lord said there. Matthew 22 and verse 37 and this is it. Listen, it says, it says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two hang all the law and the prophets. Now, a man took his text, and you don't know who it is, so I can't offend you with this. He said, that proves that you don't have to think about the Ten Commandments anymore because the Lord gave a new commandment. And he said, the first one is that you should love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then you must love your neighbor as yourself. So I want to read you something, and it's going to surprise some of you. I'm going to the book of Deuteronomy. What book did I say? Is that in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Huh? Who wrote that? Who? Now Moses wrote the first five books. And Deuteronomy is, is the fifth. And the word means story twice told. Now I want you to listen to me very carefully. I'm reading to you from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. Will you listen? It says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Now I'm going to read you something else. I'm going to Leviticus. What did I say? Who wrote that? That comes before Deuteronomy. Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. New? Then what did the Lord mean when he said, I'm giving you a new commandment? It is a fact that our Jewish uh, friends had fallen into legalism. And Jesus said to them, you're too careful about the letter of the law, and you miss the spirit of the law. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not kill. But the spirit of the law is this, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. But the spirit of the law is this, if you look at a woman and lust after her, you've committed adultery already in your heart. Would you say amen, beloved? Now Jesus came to fulfill the law. He came to show them how to do it. The Greek word comes over into English, consummate. I came as the consummate law keeper. 
I came as the example, the exemplary law keeper. I didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came to show you how to keep it, not just by letter, but by spirit. And our Jewish friends came into conflict with Christ every day because they didn't see eye to eye with him. Christ was trying to show them how to worship the Father. They were so accustomed to doing it their way, they despised him. And Jesus said to them, I'm going to introduce a new idea. And yet all he did was quote the Bible. He said, you must love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your neighbor as yourself. But he didn't say that excludes everything else. He said, under these two, hang all the laws and the prophets. Would you say amen out there? Now, ladies and gentlemen, St. Paul said that love is the fulfilling of the law. Amen. Our subject tonight is love and duty. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And I want to show you as quickly as I can just how practical that statement is. First of all, you got to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you believe that, say amen. Now, if you love God that way, you'll keep the first four commandments. The first commandment says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will never worship another god. If that makes sense, say amen. The second commandment says, don't make any statues and images and worship them if you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Does that make sense to you? The third commandment says, respect me and respect my name. Not only should you not use my name in cursing and swearing and profanity, but you shouldn't call yourself a Christian unless you live like one. Represent my name. If you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, would you say amen to that? Then he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, why should we do that? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. There are many false gods, but the difference between the true God and the false God is the true God made everything here, including the stuff the false God is made out of. And the Sabbath honors him. Oh, but you say, I don't see anything important about that. Then why did black folks fight so hard to try to get Martin Luther King's birthday set aside as a national holiday? If a day is not important, why are we doing it? We do it because God raised up a man. A great man. A man that, that with his charisma and his intelligence and his leadership marshaled black and white together so that we could overcome and because he made such a tremendous contribution to life in America and to black folks in particular we want a day on which we honor him and I vote I yeah. now if a day can honor a man God says I've got a day not once a year but every week and as long as you keep that day, you can never be an atheist or an infidel or a skeptic or a doubter. You will never do it because the very day means that you are honoring the God who in six days made the heaven and the earth. And that's the true God. Would you say amen out there? Now, if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you'll keep the first four. Now, that's what he meant when he said under these two hang. Now, the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's a whole lot of love, and by the way, you got to start with a certain intelligent kind of love for yourself. Now that isn't pride, and God never encourages pride. Some people love themselves too much. They have inordinate affection for themselves. But you've got to love yourself. you got to love yourself not to abuse it with nicotine and drugs and liquor. Would you say amen out there? You got to love yourself enough to comb your hair and brush your teeth and clean your house. Let's say amen out there. If you don't have some respect for yourself, you can't respect other people. Nothing is more detrimental to character than a loss of self-respect. That's why when you are young, you ought to keep your hands off young women. And young women, you ought to make sure they keep their hands off you. If you grow into adulthood without self-respect, what kind of marriage do you expect to have? Happy homes are homes where husbands look up to their wives because they're ladies. 
and wives realize that they are being rewarded for their virtue they respect themselves would you say amen out there so you got to start with some kind of respect for self now if you love and respect yourself and you are valuable not because you're important but because Jesus died to ransom you if you understand that that gives self-worth and then when you understand your own feelings and your own emotions and your own impulses you'll have respect for the impulses and emotions and property of others would you say amen out there and if you love your neighbor as yourself you'll start off by treating your mama and your daddy right and by the way God's law is broad and comprehensive that means more than just your blood kin it means you ought to be good to old people. Let's say amen out there. You ought to show some respect to these gray hairs that come into our midst every night. You ought to say a kind word now and then. I pastored a large church once and there was a saint in my church who got old and got sick. And then and, and we went to our home regularly, especially in those final days. And always when we went, the church folk sent along some fruit and the church folk brought flowers and the church folk came in to freshen up the house. And I was there reading and praying. And you know what? I looked and I never saw a card. I said, you have children. Well, yes, pastor, but they don't get in touch with me. Now listen, that dear soul died. And when she died, we had the funeral and they all came. Now, you, you pardon me, but I used to buy these big Electra Buicks every two years. And I had one brand new. And I went out of the church and got in my car to drive to the graveyard with the family. And someone came over and tapped on the window and said, pardon me, pastor, but you can't ride in that. Well, I said, well, all right, where shall I ride? They said, leave your car here. You come with us. And so I went with them. Do you know what they did? They opened the door to a gold-colored Cadillac and put me in it. And as the cortege drove off, I looked back and every car I saw was a gold-colored Cadillac. Not only that, but when I was preaching the funeral, those young ones were there and they tried to die. And I thought about the fact that that lady lay on her bed day in and day out without a card, without a letter, without a flower. And now they got gold Cadillacs and blankets of roses putting on a show. If you got your parents and you want them to appreciate a flower, you better give them to them while they can smell them and see them. Would you say amen out there? If you want them to enjoy something, do it now. Honor your father and your mother. And it means more than flowers and fruit. It means you ought to come around and make the work light sometimes. It means that if mother is running and ripping all day and you're watching some foolish television show and she wants a little help getting the floor scrubbed, you ought to love her more than you love the, 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 the show. And if you love your neighbor as yourself and your body and soul are motivated by the Spirit of God, that won't be any problem to you. You'll keep number five. Then the next one says, thou shalt not kill. Now, who would kill somebody if you loved him like you love yourself? And the next one says, thou shalt not commit adultery. I don't want to fool with anybody's wife and hurt their feelings because I wouldn't want anybody fooling with mine. I know how I'd feel if, 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 God forbid, something stupid like that should ever happen. So then why should I hurt my wife? What do you say out there? If you love your neighbor as yourself, then you will be true to your own wife and leave the other fellows alone. If you love your neighbor as yourself, will you steal? No, sorry. His car and his trunk and his camera will be as safe as if it were your own because you love him as you love yourself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, will you lie on him? Will you covet? Get mad because he got a new stereo and you don't have one? 
And then you go in debt just to match him, and as soon as you thought you caught up, he gets a new car, and you still mad? <laughs> Don't you see how practical it all is? That's why Jesus said, I'm introducing a new idea. Stop trying to force yourself with willpower to obey the commandments. Folk who do that are miserable. That's the highest standard on earth because it is the transcript of the character of God. And if you're trying to force yourself to measure up, you're not going to enjoy it and you're not going to let anybody else enjoy it. But if you can ever get the horse in front of the cart and fall in love with Jesus, then love is the fulfilling of the law. You don't do it now to force yourself. You do it because you love somebody. And when you love somebody, you love to please them. Try to find out what best pleases the Lord, said Paul, and do that. And you enjoy it. You enjoy it. So love is therefore the fulfilling of the law. Let's say amen out there. Now Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, if ye love me, do what? Now that's what he said explicitly. Implicitly Christ said, if you don't love me, forget it. You can't obey me. Love and duty, they've got to go together, uh, you know, hand in hand. Love and duty. Duty without love is a boa and a burden. And that's why people hate the Sabbath. That's why people hate the law. They don't love the Lord as they ought to love him. Oh, they talk about loving him, but they don't love it. There's a great difference between talking and loving. Would you say amen, beloved? Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to prove that to you. I didn't intend to, but I'm going to. You ought to write this down. It's Matthew chapter 15. What book did I say? And I'm beginning with verse 1. The Bible says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Why do you tr transgress the commandment of God with your tradition? Did you get that? Then we go down to verse 8, and I want you to hear what Jesus said. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They don't love me. It's just talk. And talk is cheap. And Jesus said that. They honor me with their mouths and their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Someone said once that the longest distance in the world is often the distance between the mouth and the heart. Jesus said the mouth is close, but the heart is far from me. They don't love me. They just talk. And they can talk up a blue streak. Well, when it comes to proving, when it comes to doing, when it comes to demonstration, they are sadly lacking. And if they can't find an excuse, they make them up. When you really love the Lord, you stop all this old belly aching and complaining and whining. And all you want to do is find out what pleases him. Lord, here is something I never knew before, but if it pleases you, I'm ready. Only a man who loves the Lord can do that. I want to read the last verse that I thought I'd read. It's verse uh, 9 of chapter 15 of Matthew. If I were you, I'd write this one down, and I'd mark it in my Bible. It says, but in vain. In what? But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. You got to love the Lord, beloved. And when you love him, you like to please him. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know, we have perverted the word love so folk don't even know what it means. I don't even, I, if I'm riding home and the radio comes on and news goes off and they start singing all this old mess about love, I just turn it off. It's disgusting because they're not even talking about what love really is. They're talking about lust and passion and petting and fooling around and committing fornication and adultery. That's what they're singing about. That kind of love is cheap. It's sheer emotionalism and suckering, sickening sentimentalism. That's all it is. Not worth a dime. And folks are marrying with it and falling apart in less than the time it takes them to court. That kind of love will not hold a family together. 
that kind of stuff is so frothy and so without substance the first argument and you'll call your wife a name you never thought would escape your throat that's not love that's Hollywood mess and we've gotten to the place our young people are victimized by it they don't even know there's another kind well I want to tell you there is the Bible says that God is love would you say amen out there and then we are told that love is more than an emotion love is a principle now emotions change but principles don't change come on now I want to say it one more time emotions change they run hot and they run cold but love is a principle and principle let me tell you what a principle is thou shalt not steal is a principle and because it's a principle it cannot be compromised thou shalt not steal when you got plenty money thou shalt not steal when you broke Thou shalt not steal when you got a belly full. Thou shalt not steal when you're hungry. Because you cannot compromise principle. A principle must stand in the sunshine and in the shadow. In the day and in the night. In the heat and in the cold. And God says when you get married, it ought to be that kind of love. The kind that will endure both in prosperity and adversity. In sickness and in health. And, and this kind of love is what the Lord is talking about. Not just love when everything's going your way, but love when you are being tried and tested and the devil is riding your back and you've run out of food and you lost your job and your wife is sick, you still love. Because love is a principle. And I wish our people would get sick of this old stupid sentimentalism that you hear lilted over the radio all the time and all it's doing is suggesting lewdness if you listen to those words as a Christian you'll blush not love at all true love is a principle in 1st John 3 18 Jesus said through his servant let us not love in word neither in tongue but in deed and in truth. Would you say amen out there? Don't just love and talk and in tongue, and I could add tongues, but let us love in deed. Well, what's a deed? That's something you do. What kind of husband would it be if he always came home, honey, I love you, but you never got a dollar to spend. You never got a new dress to wear. You didn't even live in a decent house. He spent everything on himself, but I love you. <laughs> or what kind of love would it be if your wife threw arms around your neck and said, honey, I love you. I'll be back around three in the morning. Love not in words and in tongues, but in deed and in truth, the Bible says. In 1 John 5, 2 and 3, the Bible says, By this, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Would you say amen out there? Then that's one of my favorite texts. You ought to write it down and memorize it. It's 1 John 4, 18. And this is what it says. There is no fear in love. For perfect love casteth out fear. <clears throat> Why? Because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. There are some people who join the church because they're scared. They heard about hell. They heard about the judgment. So they join. <clears throat> they decide, I'm going to be in the church because I don't want to go to hell. I'm going to be in church because I don't want to burn. But they're in there because they're scared. Let me quote you a text. The Bible says, but the fearful 
and the unbelieving and the whoremonger and all liars shall have their part in the fire amen the fearful it starts with that you can't serve God in fear he said therefore there is no fear in love perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment he that feareth is not made perfect in love let's say amen out there you can't enjoy church when you're scared you you there but you'd rather be out you can't enjoy your religion like that and that's why so many people are miserable in church they got just enough religion to make them miserable and like a man with a headache they don't want to cut off their heads but it hurts them to keep it they don't want to leave the church but it's a problem and that's why they always got something evil to say about the preacher about the service you can't please them if you preach loud they don't like it if you preach soft they don't like it if you preach the Bible they don't like it if you don't preach the Bible they don't like it if the choir sings an anthem they don't like it if the choir sings gospel they don't like it they are miserable and the preacher ain't their problem they are their own problem don't love the Lord and can't love the brethren no I gotta hurry up here but the Bible says something here Jesus said if any man now that covers the field if any man would be my disciple let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me now that's the way you got to go folks any man I got no special accommodation for certain folks and another for another that's the way it is you got to deny yourself. What does that mean? It means you got to stop doing some things that you like. The fact that you like it ain't no excuse. Got to give it up. Only way I know to do that is love somebody enough. Amen. Then you'll try to find out what best pleases him when you really love. Got to give it up. Deny yourself. Then there's some things you don't want to do that you got to do because you love. I've told this story many a time and it embarrasses my wife a little bit I guess but one night we were both asleep right here in Washington DC upstairs in our house around two or three o'clock in the morning and I'm enjoying my sleep and suddenly she touches me on the shoulder and she said honey I'm thirsty <laughs> now that's all she said she didn't even say, go get me some water. That was implied. <laughs> Were it not, she wouldn't have bothered me at all. Going and gotten her own. So when she said, I'm thirsty, it was not, not just to apprise me of certain circumstances. It was an, an imploring statement. Do something about it. Now, I didn't have to do it. My wife's sitting right there. But my wife ain't married to no henpeck man. And the best way to get me to do nothing is try to force me. See? So she didn't say, you look here, you go get me some water. <laughs> no, sir. Thank God I don't have a wife that talks to me like that. She didn't say, you have to go get it. And I didn't. Now in my house, I was under an electric blanket. It was winter time. <laughs> you get up, you wake up, you know, and, and you got to go downstairs. And if you're not awake by then, by the time you open that refrigerator and that arctic breath enshrouds you, you are rudely awakened. <laughs> and all of that popped into my head when she said, honey, I'm thirsty. Now, I didn't have to go get that water. There wasn't anybody in my house or the next 10 houses around who could make me go get that water. But did I go get that water? <laughs> now, what in the world makes a man do what he doesn't even want to do? Ain't no need to be kidding you. I didn't want to do it.
not on your life. I wanted to stay in the bed. I didn't want to. I didn't have to. And nobody could make me. Yet I did it. What makes a man act like that? Love. If you love me and you want to be my disciple, deny yourself. Get up when you don't feel like it. Sit down when you don't want to. That's what the Lord is saying. Oh, but people hate him. And they hate his word. They hate the law. You know why they hate the law? Because they can't sin the way they want to and believe in it. Fooling around with a woman, they don't want anything saying thou shalt not commit adultery. And you know every thief is not breaking in cars. Some of them are standing behind counters writing out bills and receipts. Some of them are examining people in the, in the office and overcharging. All kinds of thieves. And they can't afford to believe in a law that says thou shalt not steal when they're carrying on like that. So they hate the law. And when you talk to them about it, they say, well, it's too restrictive. Too restrictive. Well, I want to tell you about a human relationship that is more restrictive than that, and that's marriage. Now, as a pastor, I've had the privilege of uniting many couples in marriage. I have been the one in charge of many weddings. And I like them. You know, I get so tired of funerals, I appreciate weddings. Change of pace. They're always pretty. And one reason I like them, everybody's smiling. You know right? Everybody's happy. Wedding! Never seen an unhappy wedding. I've seen some lousy marriages, but not any unhappy weddings. Two people that are not going to make it at all are grinning in the we uh, wedding. You know, no, no. Now, here they stand. Look at me now. Here they stand. Here's a man and here's a woman. Now, I want you to consider that girl might have had five boyfriends, good fellows. She went out to the concert with one. She went for a walk in the park with the other. She went to the zoo with another. She went to get pizza with another. They're all nice fellows. And the young fellow might have had girlfriends like that. Went bike riding with one, went swimming with another. Nice, nothing wrong with it. But they became engaged. And now they stand before me. And they stand, you ought to look in their eyes. You all don't see them. You're looking at the back. I'm looking in the eyes. They look like you're in another world. <laughs> and I say to that young man, Wilt thou have this woman to be thy wedded wife? Wilt thou love her, honor her, cherish her in sickness and in health, in prosperity or adversity, and forsaking all other? Keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live. Dost thou so declare, and he can hardly wait for me to get through? I, I, I do. <laughs> and he's just smiling. He has just promised God and man that those other four girlfriends are done. Only her. That's restrictive. Amen. Then I turn to the young lady and I say, Well, thou had this man to be thy wedded husband. Will you love him, honor him, cherish him, obey him in sickness and health, prosperity, for the world? And she says, Oh, yes, I do. And she just smiles. There go those boyfriends. Only him. That's restrictive. Not only that, but in most states in the United States, they have what they call community property. Do you know that today, in some states, if you get a divorce, some women have to pay the men alimony? That's right. And in most states, they have community property, which means that the minute you're married, it's not yours, it's you all's. And if a man has $5,000 in the bank, the minute he marries that lady, 2,500 is hers. That's restrictive. Why, God only asks for a tithe, 10%. She's getting 50% right off the bat, and yet he's just smiling. I do. <laughs> What's wrong with him? <laughs> What's wrong with a man giving away half his property and smiling? He's in love. Would you say amen out there? Look, I know I got to hurry, but I got to tell you all this. Even if I don't see the screen tonight, I got to tell you this. There is a proverb that says, in marriage, 
It's the little things that count. You ever hear that? You heard it, haven't you? Now, I want you to get this. In marriage, it's the little things that count. Now, I could go out and buy a brand new car, and I could come home, and I could say to my wife, Honey, here's the key. That's your car. And knowing my wife, she'd act like she's very happy, but she'd know that I'm going to drive that car. <laughs> Honey, guess what I bought just for you? A washer and a dryer. And a wife will be happy, but she got to wash the man's shirts. Right? So you're not exciting them with these big things, because they're much for you and the children as for her. You know right? In marriage, it's the little things that count. And many wives who've got washers and dryers and cars still don't feel secure because their husbands have not related to them in that very personal way. That little way that makes them know my husband's been thinking about just me. So, if you want to change that, gentlemen, don't worry about a car. You can save some money. Don't worry about a washing or dryer. Now, you ought to have those things. But don't worry about something big. You see? Don't worry about something that she's got to use for the children and for you. Just get a bottle of Estee Lauder's private collection. <laughs> see? Now, that doesn't cost that much. Whole lot cheaper than a car. But when you give it to her, she knows that's just for her because you don't, shouldn't, <laughs> wear Estee Lauder's private collection. You see what I mean? If you bring home a pair of stockings, you don't wear those. That's just for her. And these little things will light up her life. Let's say amen out there. In marriage, it's the little... You think I'm just talking about marriage? I got something a whole lot more important than that to talk about. Oh, now, Pastor, I'm going to kill anybody. And Pastor, I'm not going to rape anybody. And Pastor, I'm not going to rob a bank. But when it comes to uh, 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 just a day, after all, that's such a little thing. In love, it's the little things that count. Not whether you're going to kill somebody or not, but whether you'll wear a modest dress. Huh? Not whether you're going to rob a bank or not, but whether you'll just do that little thing that the Lord wants you to do, and should you do it? Paul said, not only should you do it, but you should always be looking, trying to find out what best pleases the Lord. Because when you love somebody, you're always looking for something that makes them happy. I've seen men who dread, they act like it, act like they dread to see anniversary come. I gotta get a gift. Christmas, well, I gotta buy a gift. Man, when you love, not just Christmas and anniversary, but Halloween, Thanksgiving, Fourth of July, and then sometimes for no reason at all. Amen. <laughs> you, you, you're, you're trying to find out what best pleases your beloved. And when you love the Lord, Duty is no problem. I don't support my family because the law says you got to do it. I do it because I love them and the law couldn't matter less. Would you say amen out there? When you love the Lord, the law is no problem. When you don't love him, you hate the law. But when you love him, you're going to do what he says anyhow. Whether there is a law and a penalty or not, if the only reason you're true to your wife is you're scared she's going to divorce you, you got yourself a box of misery. But if you're true to your wife because you love her, you're not worried about divorce. Love and duty. Let's get it right. Let's love the Lord. Take the lights down. Let's go to the screen. And I've got 15 minutes and we're going to do it. We're going to close this service in 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, love and duty. 
I want to start with a text I've shown you before, Proverbs 16, 25. It says, there is a way that what? Seemeth how? Unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Folks, please remember, you can't go by what seems right to you. You got to get your religion out of the Bible. Would you say amen? All right, let's go on now. Once you find the Lord, he gives you a power and a guide. He's called the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into part of the truth. Into what? And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God. And straight on through all Ten Commandments, God spoke all of it. And the Bible says all our commandments are truth. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's not going to lead you into nine. Going to lead you into how much? Now that's the Bible, beloved. You love the Bible, don't you? Come on, do you? How many of you appreciate Pastor Brooks telling you what the Bible says? All right. Now. Who's going to get the Holy Ghost? Acts 5.32 And we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God have given to them that what? Amen. Obey him. There it is. Folk talking about all you got to do is have the Holy Ghost. Well, how are you going to get it? If you're not in love with the Lord and willing to please him, how are you going to get it? All right, the next one I have says, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, faith which worketh by what? We're talking about love tonight. Faith worketh by love. If you love me, do what? All right, let's go on. Now, beloved, Jesus loved us. Pastor Colin Braithwaite sing, sang tonight, I love him not because of this and because of that, but because he first loved me. Would you say amen out there? We are hell bound and Jesus made a way out of it. No way. Jesus made a provision. He opened up the gates of heaven that were barred against us. Jesus came down here voluntarily and laid down his life. He loved you. Went to that cross we were talking about earlier tonight where they set the nails in a way that he wouldn't die quickly. He was hanging there from the 6th to the ninth hour, from noon to 3 o'clock. And the only reason he died then was because his heart exploded in his bosom. A heart attack killed him. The nails didn't kill him. He died because your sin and my sin was upon him. And God the Father turned his back. Jesus tasted the second death, the one you and I are supposed to die, the death without hope. And when God turned his back, Jesus had a heart attack. He cried with a loud voice like anybody else having a heart attack. He screamed in his agony, dropped his head and died. And the heart exploded, filling the chest of the chest with blood and water and when that soldier's spear found its mark it opened up that fountain he loves us and that's enough Lord you did that for me and I can't do these little things for you Lord you did that for me and opened up heaven with all its glories forever and ever and ever and I can't give up a cigarette for you? What's wrong with us, Lord? You did that for me and I can't stop drinking for you, especially when you said you'd give me the power. I got habits, Lord, and they are strong habits and you said you'd come into my heart and give me the victory if I'm just willing. All you ask me to do is be willing. Oh, saints, can't you see it? Can't you see it? Gotta love him. And when you love him, the little things and the big things, whatever it is, your life is submitted. And I want to say this for my young friends. When you become a Christian, you don't dry up and become a stick in the mud. Devil will tell you that you can't have fun as a Christian. I want to tell you the devil is a liar and the father of it. You never had it so good until you start serving the Lord. Now you Christians out there who can bear a witness, say amen. Yeah. 
Young folk come telling me, if you're, if you're a Christian, there's nothing to do. What they mean is, they can't do their dirt and be a Christian. My problem is, I don't have time to do it all. Got bicycles, tennis rackets, footballs and roller sticks. Got camera and stereo. Milo, talking about nothing to do. Got to love Jesus. Get your mind right. Jesus said about his people, as soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. Now those are saints. You got the other kind who come out here to these meetings. But the saints, and I would come and preach this way if only one man would decide to do God's will. Because Jesus would have died for one person. Did you hear me? See, that's what gets to me. This is no collective uh, uh, arrangement. He, he died for whosoever, one on one. And if I had been the only sinner, he would have died for me. If you love me now, don't go talking about, well, we got a new commandment. All you have to do is love. Love and duty go hand in hand. Love not in word and tongue, but in deed and in truth. If you love me, do what? He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. Did you notice all this is New Testament? Now, folks, I'm not trying to be funny. But I sit in my car driving home and it's an enigma to me. I am absolutely amazed that folks can sit and read that and then write the kind of questions we get. Now I could read the Old Testament, it's all in there, but, but, but I'm accommodating. I'm giving folks what they say they believe. And those were not only New Testament words, that came straight out of the mouth of the Lord. And if you got a red letter edition, it's printed in red in your Bible, meaning Jesus said it. And yet we come with these questions, what's wrong with us? Oh beloved, please, uh, please try to understand. 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God. Love, this is what it is. That we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. That means they are not hard. Now they're hard if you don't love him. They're hard if you're trying to force yourself. Man, you don't love the Lord and you haven't had the Holy Ghost come inside of you with victory. Every time you see an attractive woman, you're in trouble. It's hard. But let Jesus come in and learn how to pray and you can see her coming down the street. Now I'm telling you something. You can see her coming down the street and because you love the Lord, you turn your head. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Tell me. All these preachers up here tonight, they have to live by prayer and faith and love just like you. We don't have any special deal. Victory when Christ comes into the heart. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of what? That's the New Testament. And we're going to be judged. That was verse 10. Verse 12 says, you're going to be judged by the law. And God's warning us. And after the judgment comes hell. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven and all the proud yea and all that do wickedly shall be stubble and the day that cometh shall burn them up saith the Lord of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch make no mistake about it it's coming folk getting so smart you know they've already begun to tell the Lord what's going to happen they decided they don't want any hell. So since they don't want it, they've concluded it can't happen. But the word of God shall stand forever, would you say amen out there? Y'all pardon me while I fix up my stage here. <laughs> Love of God and the word of God are constant through eternity. Would you say amen, beloved? The Bible says in Nahum 1 and verse 9, What do you imagine against the Lord? Who do you think the Lord is? He will make an utter end 
affliction shall not rise up the second time. So it's not just a matter of a decision whether you will obey or not obey. There is hell. There's no five or six ways. And by the way, there's no neutral purgatory. It's heaven or hell. If that's clear, would you say amen? Amen. Now you can decide where you want to go tonight. Bible says fire is coming down from God out of heaven. Ain't going to be any place to hide. What are you going to do when the world's on fire? The song says. You got to spend eternity somewhere, beloved. They're not going to be any little island out there somewhere, no, no moonshot where you can go out there and watch it all like a spectator of a football game. You're going to be with the Lord or with the devil. It's heaven or hell. Go set this whole world on fire. The figure in the Bible is a lake of fire. And just like Noah's ark rode upon the flood waters when the earth was destroyed before the holy city is coming down from God out of heaven and bless your heart John said I saw it coming and it's going to be like Noah's ark and all the saints of God are going to be on the inside looking out these are the folks who love the Lord these are the ones who obeyed his voice the Bible says blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city and I'm telling you tonight God's making up his number right now and the saints are going to go marching in Lord I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in what are you saying ladies and gentlemen artists have tried to paint heaven and they've done the best they could but I have not seen nor ear heard neither has entered the imagination of man what God is going to prepare for them that love him and the record is that violence shall be no shall no more be heard in thy land wasting no destruction within thy borders but thou shall call thy wall salvation and thy gates praise we've come to a violent age I long for a land where there'll be no more violence don't you Bible says that the wolf and the lamb are going to lie down together and the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb the leopard shall lie down with a kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them I want to be in a land like that don't you I want to see a little baby grab a bull lion by the mane and go walking down the road with him and that great big beast will purr like a kitten not long ago just a few weeks ago I sat in an automobile with the window rolled up and a great big lion walked right up and almost put his muzzle to the window and I shot him with my camera over and over and over again and they told me don't open the window he is so powerful and so fierce he can reach in and take your head off faster than you can roll the window up they had no trouble out of me but one of these days one of these days we're gonna walk down the road and see a big old lion coming and we're gonna say here kitty here kitty and we're gonna pat him on the head like a house cat let's say amen violence shall no more be heard in the land and they tell me the streets are made out of gold gates out of pearl don't you want to go well you may go if you be willing and obedient the record says there's also a tree of life bearing 12 manner of fruit Bible says that the tree of life is on either side of the river of life and when you eat from that tree you can't die and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation you know some of us are short and some of us are tall and some of us are fat and some of us are skinny and we got to grow up into Christ and when we get to heaven and eat of that fruit we're gonna become like Adam and Eve in the image of our Lord want to go <laughs> yes sir. not going to be in the HAACP up there that's the heavenly association for the advancement of colored people <laughs> Bible says we're going to see eye to eye by the way you're going to do that down here else you ain't going up there 
Man, that's worth going, ain't it? Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. Not only that, but the Bible says the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Whatever your problem is, it's going to be all right then. Don't know what I'm going to look like exactly, but I know one thing. The Bible says, then shall I know even as also I'm known. You're going to know me and I'm going to know you. But the Bible also says that we're going to be satisfied for we shall be like him. Not going to need any paint and mascara and a mirror to print in. Whatever you are, going to be satisfied with your glorified body. Those who were blind are going sightseeing in glory. Those who were lame are going for a hike. Want to be there? And here's my text I wrote to my mother. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. I don't picture the Lord taking a handkerchief and going around all those millions of people and wiping their eyes. Then what do you think it means? I think your eyes are going to dry up when he removes the cause of tears. What do you say? You cried when your mother went to sleep. You cried when your father died. You cried when your brother died. If they died in the Lord, you're going to be together again. No cause for crying. Oh, yeah. And there shall be no more curse. Say amen. The throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And Isaiah said, from one Sabbath to another, and from one new moon to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. That's yours and that's mine through faith and love. If you don't want to go, Something wrong with you. If there's something down here you love that much, you're willing to stay with it. You're not wrapped tight. How many of you want to go? How many of you love the Lord tonight? Say amen. amen. Lord's going to show you things he wants you to believe that you haven't even known before. But how many of you love the Lord enough you want to do it anyhow? Amen. you got to come to that to be saved. Now if you meant that, I want you to stand up tonight with a smile on your face and say, Lord, I love you. Yes, sir. Say it again. I love you enough to obey you. Let us pray. You heard us, Lord. Now I beg you in the name of Jesus to send the Holy Spirit that we might mean it. We don't want to just say it in word. We want to say it in deed and in truth. These people are standing, Lord. These are wonderful people. And you want every one of us in the kingdom. I don't even have to ask you if it's your will. I know it's your will that we be saved. But you want forces. So I beg you to send the Holy Spirit. For soon we're going to have an opportunity to back up what we said. There are some decisions to be made. I'm begging you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit amongst your people. That they'll walk with you. Walk with you. And one day go with you into your kingdom. Oh, I'm so thankful, Lord, for the truth. I don't know what to do. Bless us now, we ask in the worthy name of Christ Jesus. There is hope for you who really love the Lord. There is hope for you who do the things you've heard. There is hope for you in love obey the word. And there is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you. Obedience proves your love. There is hope for you. 
who are controlled from above. There is hope for you who with the Spirit move. There is hope in Christ for you. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Peace in your hearts. Peace in your homes. This is our earnest prayer for you in the name of our Savior. Tomorrow night, our subject is the unpardonable sin. The sin God can't forgive. You ought to hear it. Don't let anything keep you away. And bring somebody with you. Oh Lord Jesus, keep us under your care. Until then we ask again in Jesus' name. Amen.